Welcome to San Diego WhoCon 2020, virtually coming at you in 2020, as is probably not a big surprise. Joining me today is Programming Director of SD WhoCon, John Leas. John, hi. How are you doing? Good afternoon, David. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm excited uh, for this panel. It's, oh, so am I. It's a big science panel. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I'm glad we're able to get the uh, scientists from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory back again this year to do this panel for us. Yeah, this is going to be fantastic. But before we get into it with them, uh, SD Hukon supports uh, Pegasus Rising. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the charity that uh, Hukon? Absolutely. Uh, uh, SD Hukon for the last several years has uh, been supporting uh, Pegasus Rising as our charity of choice. Uh, in this day and age, it's very important the mission that they do. They help uh, injured servicemen and women with post-traumatic uh, stress disorder and traumatic brain injuries by using uh, horses as therapy. So it is a cause that is very dear to the heart of our chair, Susan Watson, and we, the rest of the executive committee, also feel it's a very important uh, mission for those individuals and even those outside the military. So if you have the opportunity to check uh, go see their website, which is strolling down. Scrolling under the bottom. Bottom. Yep. And if you have the ability to donate uh, money to their cause, SD Hukon would be very appreciative. Fantastic. Yeah, please uh, make sure you at least check the website out and see what they're all about. And then uh, hopefully you'll uh, you'll choose to make a donation there as well. John, um, let's get into it. Because I know this is an energetic panel. They're ready to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe they've come with slides. <laughs> yes. They're ready to go. So uh, why don't you uh, why don't you bring them on on in? Tell us, right. tell us who we're talking to. All right. First person we'd like to introduce today is Sarah Milkovich. So hello. Yes, Hi, Sarah. I am a scientist and a systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I um, have worked on a handful of different missions, but currently I am working on the Mars Perseverance rover, which just launched this summer. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Our next individual on the panel is Kim Stedman. Hi, Kim. Hi, everybody. I'm Kim Stedman. I also work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I am a systems engineer, and I have worked on the Cassini mission, the Opportunity rover, uh, the Curiosity rover, and I am now on the Perseverance rover. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> it's the penguin, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Penguins are intimidating. <laughs> those emperor penguins, you know? They, they know their stuff. <laughs> And one more, um, right, John? Absolutely. And last but certainly not least is Trina Ray. Hi, Trina. Hi, Hi everybody. Um, my name is Trina Ray. I also work at NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I've been there for many decades. I've worked on mostly outer planets missions. So Voyager, uh, Galileo, Cassini for decades. In fact, that's where I met Kim and Sarah. We worked together there. And now I'm off working on the next big flagship mission to the outer planets, which is the Europa Clipper mission going to a moon of Jupiter. So, Wow. That's okay, should we incredible. jump into our presentation? Yeah, let's do it. Jump right, away. Right. I will share my screen. Share my screen. Uh, la, 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 la. And now you know why we like working with Kim. There's always okay. dancing. Ding. <laughs> to do, to do, to do, to do, to yeah. do. Okay. <laughs> Slideshow. This feels ah. so official. Okay. Yeah, I hope you guys can see that. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I can no longer see anyone, but okay. So today we're going to talk to you about JPL's Europa Clipper, uh, the Mars Perseverance rover, and a few more things, including what what is JPL? Okay, so the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is one of several NASA centers. Many of you are familiar, say, with uh, the Kennedy Space Center, where we launch things, and the Johnson Space Center, where we talk to all of our astronauts. Uh, but the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is run out of Caltech, and it's where we do our robotic exploration of the solar system. And you might wonder where we got our name. Uh, over at Caltech, there were a bunch of smart uh, students over there back, way back when, I want to say in the 50s. Um, they were blowing things up and setting things on fire. And uh, the <laughs> professors over there are like, that's a bad idea. You need to go out to the Arroyo and do that. Go to the next slide, Kim. Oh, I forgot I'm doing this. 
Uh, so they went out to the Arroyo, uh, where they continued to blow things up and set things on fire. In fact, they become became experts in jets, and that's where we got our name, Jet Propulsion. Our, originally, we did a lot of work with uh, the Army for uh, launching sergeant missiles and corporate uh, corporal missiles, and so we were experts in jets, and so Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, that transitioned uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s to uh, exploring the solar system. And now, as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the facility out at the Arroyo is quite extensive. There's about 5,000 people, uh, hundreds of buildings, and uh, right uh, nestled right there in the Pasadena area of uh, the Los Angeles Region. So Trina, an interesting thing about these folks that started JPL is mm -hmm. they were really into rockets. But back then, if you were firing off rockets, rocket engines, then that you were considered an outlier, and that wasn't, uh, you know, the normal thing that people did. They didn't. It was just considered out there, and so that's why they went to Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they were doing the jet assisted takeoff, which of course is rockets on the side of the the, the engines of the planes to to make them take off in a much shorter runway. So yeah. You were considered kind of a science fiction kook if you were doing yeah, rocketry. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they were geeks to the core, but they rebranded themselves. Brilliant. Yes. So <laughs> All <about> marketing. Uh, <laughs> so what do we do now? I mean, you guys, uh, I'm sure the audience is pretty familiar with sort of uh, the robotic exploration of the solar system. You can see there that we've got rovers on Mars, which we're going to talk about today. We send spacecraft all over the solar system, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Uh, we go to comets. Uh, we also put things just in uh, orbit around the sun and take pictures of the sun. We do just all kinds of, of things. And the picture in the upper left-hand corner is still the laboratory, but just to the right of that is the deep space network. Uh, we also manage the deep space network, which is a series of antennas that are located roughly one third. There are three centers and they're roughly one third of the way around the earth. So no matter where the spacecraft is, as the earth is rotating, one of those deep space complexes is able to talk to it. And that's where the giant radio dishes uh, on the earth are located, but uh, JPL manages them. And if you've ever, basically, if you've ever seen any picture of outer space that you have seen in a textbook, most likely at least came through the deep space network if it wasn't taken by uh, one of our spacecraft. One of our spacecraft, not that we're, you know, proprietary <laughs> about these things. I mean, there are other people taking pictures. Of there are definitely planet. other people, but There's we, uh, we, we, we kind of, we kind of, we kind of have a large, large share of the market, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> a large share of the awesome. Um, yes. Okay, let's see. Uh, anything else you guys want to mention here in the intro to JPL? We're nope. still managed by Caltech. Uh, nope. No, I think we're good. Okay. Right up against yeah. the mountains. All right. So I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the mission that I'm working on right now. Uh, this is a mission that is going to one of the four large moons of Jupiter, which is called Europa. This little moon is so intriguing. Uh, it has a very young surface with big, long cracks in it. There's red junk that is spit up somehow uh, near these cracks. We don't exactly know of what it is and where it comes from. Um, Europa is tidally locked to Jupiter. So uh, it's like our moon, the same face if Europa always faces Jupiter. And as it orbits though, the other moons swing by it and tug it all the time. So Europa is constantly being tugged and twisted and just there's a lot of heat uh, inside of Europa. Not as much as Io, which has uh, eight active volcanoes usually when we fly by, but Europa still has a lot of heat. And that means that it has the energy to melt uh, some of that ice. And there is a gigantic thick ocean underneath the ice shell. Um, that ocean may be as close as three kilometers. It could be as deep as 30 kilometers. And we don't know how deep it goes. We know it's there. We know it's global. Uh, but if you were to take all the water in the oceans of the earth and add it up, and all the water in the ocean underneath this little moon, there would be more ocean underneath this little moon uh, than there is in all the oceans uh, of mm -hmm. the earth. And there's all kinds of interesting chemistry there. Uh, you know, you've got uh, just the sort of the primordial uh, material, but then things have impacted uh, the moons of Jupiter, bringing in uh, interesting chemi 
chemicals. Also, you've got sort of, you know, the solar wind is, and Jupiter's magnetic field are smashing into Europa and, and causing uh, chemical reactions on the surface. And then maybe that material gets pulled into the ocean. We don't really know. So Europa is very intriguing uh, to us. Uh, next slide. So sort of at the top of that very intriguing uh, pyramid is we have all this water, as I said, more than all the waters of the oceans of the earth combined. We have all these essential uh, elements, you know, for doing interesting chemistry. We have a ton of energy because of this tidal heating, and it's been simmering for four billion years. Uh, the ice on the top would protect the ocean uh, from the massive radiation uh, that would normally be just sort of all of the, the moons of Jupiter just sort of bathed in this radiation from Jupiter. Um, so it's just really interesting. Uh, of course, uh, we have to go. We have to explore this place. And we've been working ever since the Galileo mission to send another mission to, uh, to Europa. Next slide. And these are the things we're going to do when we get there. We're obviously, we want to investigate the ice shell. How thick is that ice shell and how deep is that ocean? And how much salt is there in that ocean? <clears throat> we want to understand the chemistry as, as much as we can. We want to look at the surface in high resolution. We have multiple cameras, infrared cameras, UV cameras, visible cameras, uh, narrow angle cameras that are going to do high resolution, wide angle cameras that are going to get context. We want to look at all of these intriguing cracks and features and lines uh, that are on the surface and understand the geology. This is ice geology, not rock geology. So there's a whole group of planetary science like Sarah is a, is a rock geologist. And she also has a background sort of in the ice geology of Mars uh, poles, right? But there's a whole group of people out there who are just ice geologists, right? They go to Antarctica, they, they do just ice geology. And they are uh, just beyond excited to get a mission uh, to uh, an ice, an icy world that has this much interesting ice geology from data that we already have. These giant cracks, uh, you know, almost like plate tectonics. This interesting chemistry with this red stuff that's all over the place that we don't exactly know what it is. Um, also, turns out since Galileo has been there in the last few years, Hubble er every once in a while goes off and looks at Europa. And it turns out that in the blackness of space, when you look at Europa, uh, sometimes you get these little excess signals and they're always kind of at the same place in the South Pole region, not South Pole, but in the Southern Hemisphere. And so it's possible that there are plumes. Now, we wouldn't have thought that in the beginning because I mean, you just don't go to plumes. That's not like, oh, yeah, look, it's a nice satellite. There's plumes. But then uh, we had a mission to Saturn, uh, the Cassini mission to Saturn, and there was a little moon there called Enceladus that had these amazing, incredible plumes. And so Europa is a lot bigger than Enceladus, so the plumes will never get as high. They'll be much closer. And sometimes when Hubble looks, they see it, and sometimes they don't. So we are... Uh, excited to have the possibility of an active plume uh, when the Europa Clipper mission uh, gets there. And of course, no matter what we do, uh, there will be a landed mission that follows, and so we have to do the reconnaissance for that. Next slide. So this is the spacecraft. Uh, it's pretty big. It's solar powered at Jupiter, so that means those are big solar powers. If you were to put this spacecraft uh, in a basketball court, it would go end to end. That would give you a sense of how big the spacecraft is. There's a high gain antenna. is the round thing there in the middle, and that's how we do our main communications link. Uh, all the cameras and everything are pointed down. Those are the nadir pointed instruments. And all of the in situ instruments, like the instruments that take in chemicals and tell you what they are, those are ram pointed. So when you fly fly by Europa, looking down, you've got all the cameras looking down, and pointed forward, you've got all the things that need to do in situ work pointed forward. So basically, all instruments are designed to work all the time on Europa flyby. And you might wonder why we're doing a flyby. Uh, Kim, if you click on that picture on the right, that should be a movie that's building up um, the tour. Yes, thank you. So we, uh, Europa's quite close to Jupiter, and that means there is a ton of radiation. Uh, I don't think that movie is going to work very well. Okay, well, just imagine that this uh, thing is looping around and uh, it's making that I, picture. I think she has to hit the play button. Did, uh, did she hit the play? Yeah, there, to the left, there's a little triangle. Oh, I see. Yeah. You? There we go. Nope. Yay. I think this is a, did it work? Uh, I don't know. I saw you hit the button and I was happy. 
Yeah, I think this is maybe a Mac to PC <laughs> yeah, thing. Actually. So imagine, now, wait a minute. I have a question. I know I'm not yeah. supposed to ask questions, but you said this would fit into a basketball court. Did you mean a football field? No, I meant a basketball court. Oh, that's not as big as I thought it would be. Okay. Well, I'm so sorry. It's gigantic. <laughs> <laughs> is there even a spacecraft that's the size of a football field? I don't think so. This is pretty big, Kim Stedman. It's a, it's a well, basketball I just, court. <laughs> I just wondered, you know. <laughs> it would sound more impressive if it was a football field, but then I don't think we'd have a launch vehicle big enough to yeah. ever launch it. Is yeah, it and actually, this is really big? crazy how they have to fold up the, the solar panel so that they tuck in at the side, and then they, we, we just barely fit uh, in the launch vehicle uh, casing. <laughs> so it's, and then they have to unfold them really carefully, and it's coarse. It's, uh, it makes the spacecraft uh, very unstable while they're doing that. It's, a lot of people spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, so uh, we don't want to get too close to Jupiter all the time because that's where the high radiation is. So the idea is you're orbiting Jupiter like 50, 60, 70 times, and you're going to do 50 flybys of Europa. You're going to buzz in. You're going to fly by. You're going to collect all your data. And then the rest of that loop, you're going to take two weeks, and you're going to play it all back, and then you're going to do it again. And it's going to take about four years to do 50 flybys. Um, if we were to go into orbit around Europa, it would take us about 30 days before the radiation kills us, 30, 60, 90, depending. Next slide. So over the course of all of those flybys, what we essentially do is we build up this web of um, ground tracks and opportunities to take data at Europa. And it's it basically enshrouds the entire uh, moon by the end of the mission. But of course, we work with a bunch of uh, science fiction geeks. And so it wasn't even 10 minutes after this very technical uh, diagram was created. Can you hit next, Kim? Before somebody had turned it into this. <laughs> the Lean Web. <laughs> yeah, the Lean Web. So, like I said, we have a lot of geeks uh, uh, in, in, in our community. Science fiction has inspired a lot of us. And so uh, it sneaks in everywhere. Uh, <laughs> there's some good stories about that once we get into the QA. So, that's kind of what the mission is. We're in the middle of building, we're at the beginning of building it. So, it takes years to build a mission like this, it takes years to get it approved. And we're just about the point where we've uh, we're going into what's called a critical design review, which means that we are about ready to build all the flight hardware that is going to be attached to the spacecraft and then launched. Uh, we don't exactly know when our launch is right now, but they have two options. It's either middle of 2024 or end of 2024, and it will we'll either be on a very big rocket and we'll get there in two and a half years, or we'll be on a smaller rocket and we'll get there in six or seven years. And... Um, because this is San Diego Dr. Who kind, I added one more slide. So, Kim, if you go to the next slide, we're in the middle of building the spacecraft. <laughs> and so people care about the magnetic noise of the spacecraft. And one of the scientists has gone off and he's talked to everybody who's building anything on the spacecraft. And he's getting the magnetic noise. So you can see the solar panels there out to the side. You can see the main bus in the middle. And then you can see that big sort of green stick that comes out. That's his magnetometer and his instruments are out at the end of it and he made this diagram and when he and then he showed it at a science meeting and of course everybody who was a doctor who fan just totally cracked up we're like are you even a doctor who fan do you, do you even understand and he's like oh i've heard of that show but i haven't watched it yet. and i was like okay i have to fix this for you so i sent him a new slide with the soundtrack and hopefully when kim hits the space bar the soundtrack will come through can you guys hear it no no. Oh no! Well, everybody at this con doesn't need to, you know, do do do. <laughs> yeah, everybody can sing. You can do, sing your own thing, right? I can hear so, it. It was hilarious. He had no idea how awesome this was to Doctor <laughs> Who fans, and so even though this is like the craziest, tiniest little weeny detail of building the Clipper, I thought this particular group would really like to see uh, this movie. <laughs> and uh, with that, I am ready to hand it over to Sarah. Okay, thank you, Trina. So moving a little closer to home, uh, going to Mars. Um, so Trina talked a bit about how Europa is on some level so different from the Earth and it's the differences that are fascinating and thinking about life, the possibility of life on Europa and, and what it might be like in that environment. Looking at Mars, um, we have been studying Mars for, for decades and decades with robotic spacecraft, and we have been able to build up 
uh, the, the history, an understanding of the history of Mars. And what that is, we look at Mars today, modern Mars, it's a cold desert. It's very, it's, it's extremely cold, it's extremely dry. And yet on the surface, there's all this evidence of ancient water. Um, it's in the shapes of the rocks, it's in the chemistry of the rocks. So we believe that ancient Mars had liquid water on the surface. Um, we may even have had a giant ocean in, in part of it, but it certainly had rivers and lakes. And we're talking about, you know, three and a half, 3.6 billion years ago for that. What is really intriguing about that is that at that same time period, Earth was very different from what it is today. Earth was actually, in terms of the, um, the conditions on the surface and the chemistry that's going on, ancient Earth and ancient Mars were very similar. And it's due to the, a lot of the fundamental differences in the size of the planets um, that have led them to evolve in, in two different directions since then. But they started out very you know, much more similar. Um, at this time period, uh, if we go to the next slide, that time period is a really intriguing time period on the Earth. Now, the oldest rocks we have on the Earth that are in this 3.6 uh, billion to older time period, they're only found in extremely rare places. So that's about, that. that's those yellow dots on this map. That's where we've been able to find these super ancient rocks. Um, the reason why we don't have more of these rocks is because Earth has plate tectonics. So we recycle the, um, the we, we're recycling our surface through uh, subduction zones and then volcanoes and mid, mid, the mid-ocean ridges. All of these destroy and recycle the, the surface. So it's really hard to find ancient rocks. Half of Mars's surface is older than 3.6 billion years, if, if our understanding is correct. So we may actually have a more complete documentation in the rock. So each rock is like, um, it's like a page in a history book. It's a page that records what the environment was like at the time that the rock formed. And so we may have more pages documenting that time period on Mars than we can find on the Earth. Now, why do we care? Because they are different planets. Well, in that time period on the Earth, that's when we have the, that, that's about the, the places where we also have the, uh, the earliest evidence of life. So life evolved on Earth around that time period, but it's really hard to understand how life started because we have such a, such a terrible record of it. We don't have enough puzzle pieces to put together. On Mars, we think the Martian conditions were very similar. So maybe life could have started on Mars as well. And maybe we'll actually be able to find evidence of it because the Martian record in that time period is so much more complete. So that's the hope. That's the, our big, uh, you know, the, the, the big question that's driving the Perseverance rover is can we find any evidence of ancient life on Mars? Um, next slide. What kind of life are we looking for? Uh, the things that you might think of as fossils, you know, dinosaurs or, you know, here we've got some fish, we've got some leaves. These are all less than 650 million years old. This is not the kind of life that uh, existed on Earth uh, back at 3.6 billion years old. What we had were um, what we call microbial biosignatures. We had these, um, so, so the finger there is pointing at a whole bunch of little layers in the rocks that are really compressed it's, um, and, and kind of wavy. These are stromatolites. Um, and I think, so these are these, uh, I think if we go to the next slide, if I remember correctly, yes. These are some modern stromatolites in Shark Bay, Australia. But, um, and so what happens is that you have, a, you have basically a layer of algae, a, micro, a, a sheet of microbes of, um, 
in the water and they have kind of a sticky ooze on the top and they capture they capture dirt particles and build a layer and then the the colony of microbes kind of move up on top of the dirty layer and and hang out there and are having a good time create more sticky ooze more dirt falls on top of them and gets trapped and you just sort of build up these domes and so what you're seeing there those those blobs, those are those are domes, um, those are stromatolites, those are colonies of of these um, bacteria or these microbes. Um, if you go to the next slide, we've also found these shapes throughout. These stromatolites go are um, also become some of the oldest signs of life that that we can recognize. So, also in Australia. Um, we have these ancient stromatolites, which are about 3.5 billion years old. Next slide. This is sort of a slice through them. So you can see we've sliced through and you can the, the those domes. And so you can see the, the building up of the layers. And there's a Sharpie for scale. Um, so this is, if we could find something like this on Mars, our, it would just be amazing. And, and that's... That would be like the ultimate discovery for us. Probably, um, though, you know, it's 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 going to what we're really going to be looking for is subtle signs in the rock, subtle patterns in the chemistry, in the shapes. Um, uh, looking for for the kinds of chemical imbalances that um, use that that might indicate that life had been present. Um, it's a lot of really subtle things, but. We're hoping for something amazing like this. Next slide. So what are we doing with the rover? The rover is all about understanding the possibilities for life on Mars. So the, the main chunk of that that we're doing is, is thinking about this ancient microbial life. We need to go to a place, understand the geology, because the geology, like I said, is the, the record of the ancient environments. As we do that, then we'll understand the potential for astrobiology, for the um, for for looking for any any of this evidence that we can find that maybe life had been present. But that's really some uh, some really subtle stuff. It's really hard to make sure to know definitively that these these patterns and this chemistry was due to. A biology process instead of a geology process. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to drill uh, drill samples of the rocks, put them in tubes, seal up the tubes, and place them on the surface of Mars. Uh, in the hopes that in the future another mission will come and pick them up and bring them back. And um, so we are the start of a campaign called Mars Sample Return. Um, and so, uh, because all of this, there's there's kinds of analysis to really know that if we found any evidence for, for ancient fossils, you really need the kinds of measurements that you can only do in laboratories here on the Earth, because you can't, like, shrink a particle accelerator and stick it on a rover and get it to survive launch. Um, that's just not really within the capabilities of amazing as our engineers are. Not quite that amazing, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so, um, so we want to bring the rocks to the laboratories. Finally, we have some instruments um, that are all about preparing for eventual human exploration, human life on Mars. Um, and I think if we go to the next slide okay so this is a um the sampling we're really only we're going to be collecting samples that are going to be about the size of a pencil um so it's not like huge rocks that we're bringing back and we're um so there's a uh one of our sample tubes drawn out over there on the side and so we're going to be driving around and we're going to um probably what we're going to do is collect a bunch of samples as we explore and then find a nice spot and drop off a bunch of samples and then drive on and and keep doing that we can go back we can if we uh we can return to a place that we've dropped off some samples and put more down or we can find another good place so that the next mission that which has a fetch rover uh doesn't have to drive as far to collect everything it can just go to one of these depots and and pick up the cool samples from there uh next slide this 
is Perseverance. This is our rover. Um, she looks a lot like Curiosity because uh, we reused a lot of the engineering designs from Curiosity and indeed some of the spare flight parts that um, were built but not used on Curiosity. So we have uh, seven science instruments. We have MassCam Z, those are our eyes on the camera, um, and they zoom. So we have zoomable, stereo, color, uh, fantastic camera. We have SuperCam, which is the next generation uh, laser spectrometer from ChemCam on Curiosity, and it's super because it has two lasers instead of just one. And it also has a microphone and some other uh, spectrometry type uh, measurements that it can do. We have RIMFAX, which is a subsurface radar. It's sort of hanging off the back end of the rover. Um, not hanging, it's located off the back end of the rover. Um, and it is it sends radar pulses as we drive along and listens for the bouncing back of the radar to, to get a sense of what's going on under the surface, if there are layers of rocks under the surface. Um, META is our weather station. And then we have these two fantastic instruments at the end of the arm that um, do the very precision chemistry, uh, mineralogy, petrology that, um, that we need to get to look for these subtle patterns, these subtle signs of life. Um, so Sherlock is a UV spectrometer. Sherlock comes with a camera called Watson. So Watson is like Watson takes pictures like our like a magnifying glass, and then Sherlock looks in um, does does these uh, more complex measurements uh, in the in the UV of the mineralogy, and then Pixel is the other instrument. Pixel is an X-ray spectrometer, and so we'll do um, uh, maps of elemental abundances of the rocks. And Sherlock and Pixel together, they each have um, they're each measuring with spot sizes about 150 microns. So we're going to get this, um, these super beautiful maps um, of, of just what the chemistry of these rocks are at a scale that's unprecedented for the surface of another planet. So I'm going to turn it over to Kim to tell us a bit more about the engineering side of things. Yeah, so Perseverance, the rover, she has a total of 23 cameras. Um, she, uh, Sarah just told you about the uh, science cameras, but we also have cameras to make sure that we're going the right place that we want to go and to make sure our rover is safe. So we have a descent imager camera. Um, so when we're landing on Mars, we can uh, watch our descent, and then we can also use it as we're driving along just to see what's going on. We have has cams in the front to look at the front wheels, has cams in the back to look at the back wheels. So when we complete a, a drive, we can make sure that none of our wheels are precariously pitched up on horrible rocks that will, you know, cause us trouble if we try to unstow the arm. We have navigation cameras that are up on the mast so that uh, they will help our rover planners drive our rover. And I'm sure I forgot somebody, but I'm not sure I who. I forgot to tell it. I forgot to talk about Moxie. Uh, oh yes, you should talk about <laughs> sorry, Moxie. Sorry, Moxie is our is our instrument. Um, so hopefully everybody who's watching this has seen the movie The Martian, and has seen, uh, you know, when when Watney's driving from one landing site to the next, it's because all of the equipment is already at the next uh, site. We're trying, to, and that's exactly how NASA wants to do human exploration of Mars. People need a lot of stuff. Let's see how much of it we can make from the materials on Mars. Uh, MOXIE is, it's called an in-situ resource utilization. So it, um, humans need oxygen, not just to breathe, but to launch the rockets back up to get people home. Uh, and so MOXIE is going to try making oxygen from the carbon dioxide atmosphere by sucking in the atmosphere into this box and essentially running a fuel cell in reverse to split the carbon dioxide out into CO and oxygen. And uh, so we're going to try it on the rover, see how it works, see if it breaks, see if we understand how it breaks before we have to do it for people. Yeah, so it's like the oxygenator for uh, the Martian. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so um, anybody who has uh, paid any attention to the Mars Science Laboratory, better known as the Curiosity rover, has heard about the wheel issues. Um, mm -hmm. She has very thin wheels, they're aluminum, and as we've been driving on Mars, we've run across little shards, rocks that we call shards of death for our 
wheels and we've got a lot of wheel holes in our wheels um, we're still able to drive the rover we just have to be a lot more careful how we drive her and rocks that we thought when we landed that we could safely drive over and we now go around and so the folks at JPL spent a lot of time trying to make sure that we're not going to have that problem with the Perseverance rover. So our wheels have been completely redesigned and tested for over 50 kilometers. And they're thicker, uh, they're thinner uh, in the width, but they're thicker. And as you can tell, uh, the Curiosity wheels have these jagged um, treads, and now we have little wavy treads. And so we think this is gonna be a huge improvement. And I'm sure when we land, we will have lots of problems. We're hoping that holes in our wheels will not be one of the problems that we have. <laughs> um, and another technology demonstration uh, thing that's going to go along with uh, the Perseverance rover, almost said curiosity, is the is a helicopter. It'll be our first attempt to fly anything on another planet. And the helicopter was named uh, Ingenuity. Uh, the way that they named the rover and the helicopter was there was a an essay writing contest for kids from K through 12, and then NASA picked. Um, the finalists and that's where they got the names. And so there's a great video out there of both of the kids that uh, put in the name uh, Perseverance and, and the, the, the girl who put in the name Ingenuity and they reading their essays and it's really fantastic. And so that's how they both got their name. So Ingenuity is the helicopter, Perseverance is the rover. And here is the helicopter, the actual one that is on its way with Perseverance to Mars. And as you can see, it's uh, it's got some really long uh, rotors. The rotors are four feet long, even though I think the helicopter itself is only about 20 inches high. Um, and um, how are you going to get a helicopter that you're going to fly on Mars to Mars? And uh, you bundle it up with your rover. You attach it to the belly of your rover. And so here is Ingenuity with her little arms, you know, her little legs. Uh, tied down so that um, they won't come loose uh, while we're uh, on our cruise to Mars. And she's all folded up. And there she is. And so believe it or not, when we get to Mars, we're going to just, she'll have a shield covering her to protect her from that descent onto the Martian surface. We are going to just actually deploy her and I think it's four or five different steps. Uh, part of the, the helicopter will get deployed and then eventually we'll just drop her on the surface of Mars and drive away. And then we'll hang out about 100 meters away from her while she does her test flights. And um, after we do what we call our, you know, surface operations transition from cruise to surface operations, at the end of that, that's when we'll actually fly the helicopter. So it'll be very early in our mission. And, oh yes, I forgot about this, but yes. So um, as you all know, you are at home and you're watching us and we recorded this before before the convention was supposed to take place because we cannot gather together because of COVID-19. And so this was a big challenge because our rover was shipped to Kennedy Space Center back in February. And so the final, the unloading and the final putting everything together and getting the rover and everything stacked to launch. That was all done during COVID. And so it was a big challenge. And uh, the number one um, goal and the, the biggest thing was to make sure that everybody from the, the people that worked on the, the launch vehicle, the Atlas V, to, to our people working on our rover, that they all stayed safe. And so we wanted to put something on the rover to commemorate this time and to um, just really um, say some sort of really nice tribute to our healthcare workers who have really given everything that they can during this time period. And so this is just a, a three by five inch plate and it's uh, just on the, where do they put it? On the left side of the rover chassis. And so it was attached down at Kennedy Space Center. That's lovely. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, I'm not sure whose idea that was, but I would love to know because it was a great idea. Yeah. So here we are. Um, this is the rover inside the back shell, and the thing at the bottom is a heat shield. And on the top, that's our cruise stage. And so this is what the uh, rover looked like getting all stacked before she went into the launch vehicle. Um, there is, uh, there's our spacecraft upside down getting mated with the, the payload fairing. This is the five meter diameter payload fairing from uh, the Atlas V folks. 
your gigantic, mostly empty <laughs> payload fairing that you fit well, in. Either. So the problem was neener, the neener, diameter. Neener. We needed the diameter so that because we have a wide spacecraft that that heat shield's She's, very wide. So yes. Yeah. We, and actually, I could talk to you about this payload fairing, but it, but we don't have the time. But th you should look this up. It is a fantastic payload fairing. So, oh, yeah. And uh, on July 30th, we launched. Again, we launched on an Atlas V. And the version of the launch vehicle that we launched on was a 541. Five for the five-meter payload fairing. Four because there was four solid rocket boosters to help us get up and, and get on our way to Mars really fast. And then one Centaur upper stage. So this is my little story I like to tell. So right after launch, I was, you know, we were all at home for launch, except the people that are actually working launch operations. They were down at, in Kennedy Space Center in Florida. But the rest of us were all at home. And, and it was very early in the morning, like 4.30 in the morning. And we were all on like WebEx or, or Zoom or whatever with all of our coworkers and some of our friends and family because we couldn't be together because of the COVID-19. And, and an earthquake. That's true. Uh, it was about just a little bit before launch, there was an earthquake in California. And then we all were like, oh, it's 2020. What else is going to happen? And um, so we got off the ground. And this is a beautiful, beautiful picture taken by the launch vehicle people, the ULA folks. Um, and so everybody starts celebrating that's family and friends. And, and they're like, why aren't you celebrating? I'm like, no, 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 this is step one. We, we have to, we have to, you know, separate. Uh, the centaur has to fire. We have to launch that payload fairing. There's so many things. I will celebrate much, much later. So yeah, so it, it took about an hour for us to actually, yeah, we're on our way to Mars and, and really actually celebrate. And then just the other day, we were doing a dress rehearsal of landing at the lab and uh, this was a, an activity that was yesterday on the Friday. And um, at 11.30 at night, while they're in the middle of their dress rehearsal that we're landing on Mars, um, we get a, what is a 4.6 earthquake out yeah. here that, that woke everybody up, yeah. shook e everything. Yeah. And it was, it was quite shocking. So <laughs> it's been a, a weird year out here. So now that we have launched back in July. Now we're on our way to Mars. Woohoo! So we have a couple of trajectory change maneuvers that we're going to do to make sure that we arrive at Mars exactly when we mean to. So the reason we have to get there at a certain time is we want to, once we land, Earth will have already set on Mars, which means we cannot talk directly to the rover. So we have to um, arrive at Mars just when the Mars Reconnaissance orbiter is going over so we have someone to talk to because otherwise the rover would be very lonely and we wouldn't get much data from her because Earth is already set. So we make sure that we land exactly when MRO is listening and uh, Sarah will talk to you about our landing. Yeah, so we're using the same the, the same type of landing system that Curiosity used, which is the sky crane uh, maneuver. So that's with the, the um, sort of the jetpack backpack, I like to think of it, that carries it down and then drops, you know, lowers the rover on a winch and sets a it. Bridle. Very, bridle, sorry. Uh, bridle. Sets, <laughs> sets it very, very gently and lovingly on the surface of Mars before crashing <laughs> somewhere else. Um, this time we have a slightly, we have a new twist on that. We have a new landing technique uh, called terrain relative navigation. Um, we have a setup uh, the landing, the lander vision system, or Elvis, uh, takes photos as we're coming down and compares those photos to an onboard map um, of orbital data that, that is already loaded on, on the uh, computer and compares so that it can figure out where, where are we coming down. Um, if we're coming down on, on some of the sharp pointy rocks, in our landing site, uh, then it will use this divert maneuver to to put us into a, a very nice spot within our ellipse. So that's letting us go to a more complicated, slightly more uh, a place that has has more terrain variations. It's considered a more hazardous location than we've been able to do before, um, because of course, the pointy rocks are the interesting rocks uh, to the geologists, but they're also the deadlier rocks and the, the engineers want to make sure that we've got some nice smooth rocks to, to land on. 
So if you go to the next slide. This also lets us uh, shrink our landing ellipse and gets yes. us a lot closer to everything that the scientists want to see because Curiosity rover took quite a while to get to Gell Crater. Her whole purpose was, or to get to Mount Sharp. Her whole purpose was to land in Gell Crater and then drive over to Mount Sharp and start ascending the mountain to get all, to all these layers that make the geologists so happy. Yay, layers! And, but, so it took Curiosity quite a while to get over there because there were these uh, inconvenient sand dunes between where she landed and where she wanted to go. So we, we had to take the long route. And so this is hopefully going to get us a lot closer to where the scientists want to go much sooner. And so we can have happy scientists. Yay. Okay, so we're going, our, our, our home to be is Jezero Crater. So this is a topographic map of Mars. Um, sort of, you know, unrolled and with the poles cut off. Uh, blue is low and red is high. So we have these low, these uh, northern lowlands and the the southern highlands, which is where the really ancient cr uh, crust, the cratered crust is, and Jezero is right on the edge of that. Um, it's a little crater right on the edge of a really big crater. Um, and if you go to the next slide, one of the reasons why this is such an amazing place to go, um, so now this is a picture from orbit. Jezero Crater is the big circle. The white circle is our landing ellipse. Um, but on the edges of this crater, you can see there's, um, there's a depression marked the lower inlet valley and a depression marked the outlet channel. And to a geologist looking at these, this just screams dry riverbed. Yeah. So yeah. what we've got is we've got, um, so, so we know that this crater had to have formed about in the 3.8, 3.6 billion years time period because of its relationship with the giant crater that it's right, it's, it's right next to or right on the edge of. It has a dry riverbed that goes into the crater and then an outlet channel. So this, there was a river once that filled up this crater, formed a lake, and then drained out the side. And furthermore, um, in you can kind of see it on the it's part uh, it's on the edge of where the the inlet valley hits into the crater, and then it extends into the landing ellipse. There's a delta. This is um, it's it's the it's a fan shape. It's a feature that forms when you have a river loaded with sediment that pours into a larger still body of water. So like the Mississippi Delta, the Nile Delta, it's a fantastic place. This is, it's, it's just, you know, when you look at it up close, it looks exactly like these sorts of features. Um, if you go to the next slide. I think here's our evil laughs, Sarah, right? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so good. It is, this is so, so uh, these are amazing environments. They are habitable environments. They also are um, a place where, uh, you, you know, you've got the still water, you've got um, sediment coming in from upstream. You can have, it's a, you know, just think about the microbes that could have lived there and then been buried really quickly and trapped so that the record of them could be preserved all this time. So the, here's a river delta in Alaska and um, those colors there, that's algae. There's, there's, there's algae growing on the mud. And um, so, yeah, so we are so excited about going to this place on Mars and, um, and, and yeah, just can't wait. Uh, I think, yes, yeah, so we land in February, February 18th, 2021. Oh. Um, okay, so I'll yes, I think Kim, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Yeah, I'm I gonna believe. stop sharing. Dun, 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 dun. Stop sharing. See if I can see you guys again. Can you see us? Yeah, I see you. I'm yeah. Hi, Kim. <laughs> so I didn't know we were going to have uh, people who actually would talk to us. So if you guys have any questions, you can ask us yeah. questions or we can make up our own and ask ourselves questions. Well, I, I'd like to ask Trina a question. Um, Trina, you've been working on these probes since Voyager. How has the approach to the science changed over that period of time? Ooh, that's a good one. So... Um, they did, sort of is the scientific method playing out over the course of my lifetime, right? So uh, when we first uh, sent a spacecraft, we didn't know that much about it, about the location. Right. So the 
so for example, going to Saturn, right? You had one of the pioneers go by. Um, it had instruments that were not as sophisticated, and uh, but it, it showed you something that was very interesting. So that helped teach you what the next set of questions were. And then those questions uh, get answered by the next instrument or spacecraft that goes, Voyager flies by. And then when Voyager, for example, flew by Saturn, they took a ton of pictures of the moon Titan, which was enshrouded in a thick atmosphere and we didn't know that. So then the next spacecraft that goes had a probe that was gonna drift down through those clouds and go to the surface of Titan. And had instruments that were designed to see through to the surface of Titan. And we learned a ton about Titan. So the next spacecraft that's going to go is going to actually uh, is in development right now. It's going to be uh, an octocopter, a quadcopter that lands uh, on the surface of Titan and then uh, does sort of 16 days. Think of it as a rover on Titan. It's going to land. It's called Dragonfly. It's going to land. It's going to do 16 days of operations. And then it's going to fly off to another location. So just like the rovers on Mars move around and scoop and sample, uh, that's what this spacecraft will be. So really, that's the scientific process, right? You have a question, you have a hypothesis, you take data, you you uh, study it, you uh, evaluate it, you write uh, peer-reviewed journals where other scientists get a chance to tell you what a stupid idiot you are. And you're like, oh, you're right, I should have caught that. Or how brilliant you are. Science no, is very competitive. No. <laughs> Science is very competitive. People don't realize this, but it's actually what makes it great. It's the way that sports makes things great, right? Like you have to compete to get your instrument on the spacecraft. Then you have to compete to get the resources, the data volume and the power. Then you have to compete to get your data published. And then everybody takes a shot at you. And their reputation is made if they can they can show that you were wrong, right? It's great. It's <laughs> it's humanity at its best, right? But then right. over the course of my lifetime, we've gone from, you know, these places have just been stars, right? You looked at them through telescopes and they were just bits of light. And now they are worlds with geology and geologists are sending robot geologists. I'm getting goosebumps. I love working <laughs> for NASA. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, that's, that's, and so we've been part of that, right? Our careers have just spanned this, this part of, of the exploration of the solar system is fantastic. Well, I think there, you made a comment when you were talking about uh, Europa and the cameras that are focusing on it. There was a tight camera and then there's a wider camera, which you said helps mm -hmm. give context. Yeah. And that, I, that hit me really hard. It's like, context is everything you can focus too tightly on one thing and not see the bigger picture right so right well actually all is, the information. Yeah. yeah sarah's dot when she showed you that jezreel crater right she started yeah. with the map of mars why is this interesting because it's right on that boundary then she zoomed into a higher resolution but not the highest right and then zoomed into the highest resolution that showed you the the river delta right it's the it's the yeah. context of all of that right sarah well, the yeah the and you need do the same thing need, and oh. the, yeah, so you'll need um, you need the, the the big context to figure out where you are and and put the specific location you're thinking about into that global context. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you need the the smaller scale to understand. Yeah, it's the details are going to tell you the the story of what's going on, um, and that's why. Ultimately, for um, you know, for Europa, for Titan, and for Mars, for all sorts of places, and the Moon, um, you know, what you want is you want you want a global picture from orbiters, you want a detailed picture from the ground, from ground truth, yep. uh, yeah, you need that ground truth thing because like we can put we can look at the different wavelengths of light that reflect off the surface, and from orbit we can say things about the chemistry of the surface that we're looking at from that. But that's really filtered through our understanding based on laboratory measurements of how does this material behave in that wavelength under those conditions. And so you don't ever really know for like 100% positive until you can get on the surface and you know touch it and lick it and all those sorts of things. Um, and the questions never end. You answer That's a true. question. And so, you know, we answer a question. And the very next thing we do is we turn around to the engineers and we say, okay, now we want to go somewhere harder. We want to do yeah. something more dangerous. We, we want to do take... something with a spacecraft that no one ever thought you'd ever want to do. <laughs> exactly. And it's totally against flight rules. So please get us there. 
Yeah, we had yeah, to do basically. that on Cassini with uh, with fly through the plumes through of the plume of Enceladus. So, Take so the spacecraft <laughs> twenty five kilometers from the surface of Enceladus and fly directly through the plumes. And and we want to do that without uh, without the thrusters holding us onto the correct pointing yeah. and the and, and the and correct what's trajectory. The plumes? We don't know. We don't know. Could it damage uh, the spacecraft? How, how much know? are the plumes pushing well, on the well, spacecraft? We don't know, but we'll uh, we out. need, we'll we need to know. You, if that's important that you need to know that, we'll study the plumes, <laughs> we'll give you a model, and then you can figure out if the thrusters need to be on or if we can deal and with it. And then we do plumes. very conservative things, like we'll just go through the outside of the plumes and just yeah. toe dip in. Oh, yeah. and then, oh, that was fine. That, that we're good. A little deeper um, next time. A little deeper. And we're going a little deeper. Oh, okay, that's fine. And we go deeper and deeper and Straight go through, through the way out here. Oh, okay. Yes. We, and we and, so and from all kilometers. of that, from all, yeah. but from all of that, put, uh, the data that was collected, you know, when we, when, when Cassini was launched, we didn't know there was a plume coming out of Enceladus. Uh, <laughs> and by the time we finished all those hair raising flybys that caused a lot of people to lose a lot of sleep. Uh, now we know that there is not only a plume, but there's an ocean under the surface. There's liquid water under the surface of this moon way out at Saturn. And um, it's another place we're interested in from a, could there be life in the solar system yeah. kind of picture. Totally want to go back there. Yes. Well, I remember when I was a kid, it, it seemed like with Voyager going out, like everything just seemed lifeless. And in the course of my lifetime, it's like, oh no, there's a lot more potential out here than we thought. And it's like with every single probe that goes out, there's more and more things that are looking positive to finding evidence that there's life elsewhere. And I mean, even recently, the the news about Venus, right? Oh, the Venus clouds, yeah. Yeah, I think part of that is uh, because we have a better understanding of all the places that we find life on Earth. I mean, so that understanding of, of microbes living in extreme environments on the Earth has really come a long way. Um, you right, think like about the vents at the bottom of the ocean where there's no absolutely. life. And then you yeah. get down there with a submarine and it's just teeming with life. And you're like, yep. oh, okay. You know, yeah. And then all of a sudden Europa or Enceladus where there's no light that gets down to that ocean. But you're like, but there's a ton of heat, you know. As we look at each other across the table, across the virtual table, you know, we're like, <laughs> are you thinking well, what I'm thinking? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Because I'm thinking it. Yeah, but I don't know, Pinky. It's here where there's no light. There's still life in it, you know. It's yeah, really cool you, looking. You just really you know, you cool dig, looking. You dig down, like, and microbes, you find them in the ice in Antarctica, you find them in hot springs everywhere, you find them you know miles underground and it's because it's the chemistry that they're living off of so yeah. um yeah so that's why you know the venus the phosphine and venus stuff is really amazing um it's going to be really interesting to to see what kind of follow-up studies can be done that's the situation where be skeptical um, though right we yeah that's the situation where we don't have a lot of data about uh, in you know we don't like the laboratory data to compare to the results yeah. from the spacecraft or from the I'm not I don't remember was it was it from the spacecraft I think was it from uh, Venus we don't have the laboratory I don't data remember. Kind of stuff. We, totally we don't have, we don't have the right kind of and yeah so um, so this is a situation where like yes I am I love robots going out and exploring the solar system but I also am like we need people to do the lab experiments to be funded to do the lab experiments for us to compare our data to <laughs> it seems boring but i mean we totally need that for titan too right there's so much interesting chemistry going on in titan right like mars if you're a geologist mars is like a candy land right there's so much going on but if you're a chemist a place like titan is just it's like candy land and we need so much and better funding for the labs that are just doing the basic well what does this chemical do when it is that cold in these conditions for this long, we right? It just, we just need that basic science research. Yeah, well, I think it, it's, it's, I know from my own experience with my friends and family members and whatnot, seeing how active and, you know, alive a lot of these worlds are within our own solar system has been a huge surprise, mm -hmm. but it's actually making people excited about exploring again which i think is fantastic um even the pluto flyby 
Oh my gosh. I mean, that oh, was, that, was that was amazing. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah. Was that just not, I mean, I felt like I really got slapped upside the head there, right? Because I was like, hi, you know, so far from the sun, probably going to be kind of boring, right? You know, I was getting, <laughs> I felt like pretty cocky that that was going to be boring. <laughs> and then it was like, ha ha, you know, smack you upside the head. And it totally reset me back to where I was sort of the beginning of my career, which is like, if we haven't been there before, we should go because you don't know what you're going to find. Right. right. And so then like the very next discovery mission was um, I think it was a Mars mission and a Titan mission. God, I would have loved that. Um, but it was also a mission to an iron asteroid, the Psyche mission. And when the Psyche mission won, I'm like, thumbs up. Never been to an iron asteroid. I am totally for it. I have no idea what we're going to find, but it is going to be awesome. Right. Oh man, it's um I just find it all so exciting. And and what I think is really interesting is is anybody who's a fan of sci-fi, Doctor Who or Star Trek, yeah. you know, Star Wars, either one is we all enjoy that kind of idea that there's so much variation in life in the universe. And just looking at the work that you guys are doing, bringing us these images, bringing us the data on on our own worlds here it is as diverse and exciting and strange and unexpected as the fantasy writers have been writing. And I, and I think that's really kind of making me wonder, you know, more and more what, what is there more to learn? Cause every time we do a new mission out there, it's like, Whoa, I didn't think that was possible. Like lakes, oceans underneath ice where potentially life could be. And, you know, Titan with its big hazy cloud, but oh, it's got an amazing geology and lake system all around it. What's going on there? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. And Titan wasn't anything like if you go back and look at some of the material that was out when Cassim was on her way to Saturn. Um, there was all this. What this is what we're going to find when we get to Titan, and they weren't not exactly <laughs> correct. They we're not. <laughs> so. So well, at the time, we... Titan was the largest piece of unexplored territory left in the solar system. And then once we did the Cassini mission, then it became Pluto. Now we've done the new, then it became Ceres. And now we've done um, the uh, that mission. Uh, well, the Ceres mission. was a big surprise, right? <laughs> oh, the, yeah, the Ceres and the, the mountains. And like, then they, they, there's like ice and all it's sorts this, of. This uh, yeah. crater with the salt. Yeah, ice yeah. Crater. yeah. Uh, was, I, remember, I remember the first images coming in. They're like, there's something really reflective going on here. Yes. We don't understand what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> it's on the top of this mountain inside of this crater. It's, it's, it's great stuff. Hey, David, I've got a question for them. Yep. Uh, as David mentioned, you know, we, we spent most of our lifetimes watching shows like Doctor Who, Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars, Star Trek, where we see that life is just prevalent throughout the galaxy or in some other galaxy. What would it mean to the three of you if you could actually be on a mission where you could actually confirm the existence existence of life, either past or even present? And how do you think space exploration will change as a result? Wow. That's a hard one. That's um, a softball question. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> a I mean, I think, I think I, on some level, <laughs> on on some level, uh, you know, it would be great if the mission that I'm on now becomes the one that, you know, we're hoping to 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 go find this evidence of of ancient bacterial life. Um, it's you know we know so little about how how life that the how life actually started like that that transition from being just a complicated set of chemistry to a the self-replicating complicated chemistry before we get you know we we can understand how you get from from bacteria to people who make star trek but uh how you go from rock to bacteria but how, do you, how do you go from rock <laughs> to bacteria is a really hard question to answer and um and i think so I, I just think about like our understanding of, of the solar system and the formation of planets just grew immensely when we got samples from the moon. And so we went from having a data set of one planet to having two planets and that changed everything. And so 
thinking about under our understanding of of life and the evolution of life the if we go out and we can find life somewhere else that will also have just this exponential effect Perfect. on our under just understanding um and if we go and we look in all these places and we don't find life that also i think will be a uh i don't at least in the scientific community, it'll be a profound statement on the difficulty of starting up life um, and and just the unique planet that we have for ourselves here. Yeah, there 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 is in the bigger picture. I mean, this is a this is sort of a fundamentally human question about this. If it turns out that in our solar system, we have two separate genesises of life that are completely independent. It says something about how easily life comes out of basic chemistry and physics and, and energy. And it would profoundly change our understanding of how likely it is that the universe is populated with life, right? If we had two separate genesis here in our solar system. Right. Because um, life shows life shows on Earth that once it's here, it's persistent. Right. It's, it's all the same, right? It all comes from the can same survive in whatever environment. <clears throat> question of how precious is that moment of actually having life begin, right? That's yeah, the and the diversity of life that we have here is, is amazing. And so, one of the questions that we always ask about these missions is if we find life, will we actually recognize that it is life? Right. That's the hard thing. And then, once, you know, if we, if we can get, if, if everything goes well, you know, it is 2020 um, and Perseverance lands softly, gently, and we actually are able to complete our mission. And then there is a follow on, you know, mission that goes and has the fetch rover and gets our samples and brings them back. I think that's going to change everything, regardless of what we find. Getting actual more than more than just the the pieces that fall is asteroids and stuff. Getting getting, you know, this diverse because the, the scientists will select the samples that they want by all this criteria and they want it to be this diverse sample and it will, it will just be amazing. I think it's just going to change everything. Yeah. You know, it's just, and that is the way that is the path of science, right? That is, that is the, the what we do. Uh, yeah. And it just, we it learn. It, 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 then it'll teach us what the next questions will be and what the next spacecraft or what the next human mission should do. It's, it's, it's an exciting time. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. Fantastic. Um, I want to ask the question because you are three ladies in science um, and, uh, you know, bringing uh, women into the sciences is uh, an important topic. Uh, what advice do you have for young women who are watching this panel who are interested in becoming scientists like yourselves? How, 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 how should they go about getting into, into that field? Kim, well, you want to go first? I think, first of all, I guess we should talk about where we went to school and how we got to where we are. Mm -hmm. And because if you go to JPL and you randomly go into the buildings and you grab 50 different people, their backgrounds are going to be so diverse and different. And the ways that they actually got to JPL are, are never similar. I mean, we've done this before where we just sit around and ask everybody, how did you get here? And so I'm an engineer. I'm an aerospace engineer. I went to Georgia Tech and got my master's degree there. And then I... You remember the Sojourner rover, the Pathfinder mission? Um, Donna Shirley was one of the engineers, the main engineers on that mission, who was also a woman. And so I got her email, and I, while I was a graduate student, about to graduate with my master's degree in aerospace engineering, I sent her an email. I said, hey, this is me, and I would love to work there, and can I send you my resume? And I did. And she said, yes, absolutely, send me your resume. I did. And she, she took my resume. I don't know how many people she sent it to. To, but you know, a few months later, I, JPL doesn't move very fast. I got a, I got a, a call in the middle of Seinfeld, um, asking me to fly out. To, I know a time difference. Such a random detail. I know. I, it's just, and I'll never forget it. That you know, because I turned off the TV. Ah. Uh. You know, you answer the phone. It's like, hi, blah 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 from JPL. What? Turn <laughs> off the TV. And I wasn't the only one watching the TV. So <laughs> that's what's funny about that. So I'm a person I'm watching this, this, the TV with, and he's like, well, what are you doing? Well, it's JPL. So anyway, <laughs> so yeah, and they flew me out here and I interviewed for like, it was a nine and a half hour day interviewing with all these different people. And so, and that's then insane. I got a job offer from them. But again, about JPL is 
a month later, I, I accepted the job offer. And well, a month later, I got a- fairness, JPL deals in projects that run decades. Yes, so, yes. So, I you know, but I'm just telling people, if you apply at JPL and you don't hear for a little while, don't give up hope. <laughs> because I accepted my job at JPL and uh, then I got a call one day. Hey, this is so-and-so from JPL. I'd like to offer you a job. I'm like, I already have a job. Really? Where? JPL. Oh, okay. We'll get you sooner or later. So the second job they called me for, so I was hired for one project that ended up getting canceled. And the second job they were going to offer me was on the Cassini mission. And so when the what I was working on was getting canceled, I went back to that person and said, hey, I'm available now. And so that's how I got on the Cassini mission. <laughs> awesome. And my, my advice is, um, is to do as many um, internships as you can. Because I find that internships are fantastic. You you get to do stuff that, and, and try it out. Because as an, as an aerospace engineer, I can do many different jobs on a mission. And so you can try a couple different things out and see where your niche really is. Do you want to, to be a specialist and be a telecom engineer and only work on telecom? Or do you want to be a specialist like me? I'm a systems engineer and I work the whole systems. Or what do you want to do? Do you want to work on just rovers or do you want to do a little bit of everything? So internships are a great way. Awesome. Sarah, you want to go? Um, sure. Uh, so um, I I fell in love with the idea of the working on the t with the team behind spacecraft like really early on uh, from watching watching Nova specials on the Voyager flybys and things like that. Um, uh, and and so I can blame Trina for all of this <laughs> because she was working on it. <laughs> and uh, I can't blame uh, happily. <laughs> we got Sarah Milkovich out of it. That's awesome. Yay! Uh, and then Trina was my group supervisor for a while. Uh, so the um, for me, I did. I also did um, internships, and I did. I did high school. I like high school, and over the summer, um, you know, I did a lot of the just just going to sort of nerd camps, and and then trying to see if. I could get a job um, helping in a research lab and that kind of thing. Um, and so I went to Caltech for my undergrad, got an undergraduate degree in planetary science. I went to Brown University for a master's and PhD in planetary geology and came out to JPL to do a postdoc doing, so I came in the research route, but I knew where I wanted to end up was spacecraft whether that was spacecraft on a science team or what, I just was like, science was my entry ticket. Um, and that was in part because of a great love of geology that was instilled in me growing up by uh, my parents. Um, and, uh, but then I realized that I wasn't as taken with doing the research. I really wanted to work with the team. And so I ended up transitioning into this sort of science system engineering world. So Kim and and Trina and I, like Kim and I have met kind of in the middle where I come in from the science side and I'm bringing the scientists perspective over to the engineers. And Kim then is also bringing the engineers perspective over to the scientists. And the, the two of us uh, work together to, to kind of translate that to, to bridge those two groups. Yeah, because they don't speak the same language. They do Even not. when they're talking about the same exact thing, if they're talking about the reaction wheels on a spacecraft or just turning the spacecraft, the way that the attitude control engineer refers to a turn is different than the way the scientist refers to it. <laughs> and it is very funny that that's true. So I, when I was on Cassini, I was in the science planning team working with Trina, and then I moved downstairs to the uh, engineering operations team and the first meeting I was in with the attitude control people I was like they're like well they want that I'm like that's not what they want they want this how do you not understand that and then I'm like hey this is something I'm good at there's a whole career here yeah, yeah so so um I guess for me my advice is a I guess my advice is kind of two two main things one of them is to is is the to not underestimate the value of, of learning how to communicate and communicate to a variety of different people. Um, you know, the we need the engineers to understand the scientists. It's 
um, we need the other way around. We need the public to understand why what we're doing is worth funding. Um, it doesn't matter how good an idea you have if you can't explain it to somebody, you gotta get it out there. Um, and then the other thing um, is really, uh, you know, there's a lot of, the world does put a lot of obstacles in your way. Um, if you're a woman in STEM or uh, underrepresented minority in STEM, um, just from people's assumptions about you, but, um, and that, that, is the world pushing on you, but you need to not also, you need to not listen. If you have a little voice in the back of your head that's saying, this is hard, I'm not good enough, I can't do it. You have to learn to ignore that voice and just be like, I wanna do it, therefore I'm gonna do it. And 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 just- I'll learn how to be good at I'll, it. I'll learn, yes, I'll I, can, I can learn on the job. And um, yeah, that's my main advice. I want, therefore I will. Yes. <laughs> So uh, I had a path uh, sort of in between the two, actually. Uh, I was, um, I'm, uh, was going to school locally at a, at a state college here. And, um, you know, somebody gave me a piece of advice that says you really should do a summer internship. And I'm like, really? I don't know about that. Well, should I do that? So anyway, I applied to a couple of places. And one of the places I applied was uh, JPL. And I ended up getting a job on the Voyager project on the Neptune encounter, which was incredible right and when i saw that I, I was physics and astronomy major at the time at the state university when i saw that i was like oh my gosh this is unbelievable how amazingly interesting and compelling this work is and how you feel like you're contributing to like the human race in a positive way and it's right here and 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 i would love to you know kind of stay and get this job and stay at the lab. And it turns out I met people like Sarah at the time. It wasn't Sarah, it was somebody obviously older than Sarah. Uh, but I met people <laughs> who had basically Sarah's job, right? And some of them were scientists, but some of them were, um, uh, you know, they had PhDs, but some of them didn't. They just sort of were, you know, they had master's degrees or maybe they just had bachelor's degrees. And, but they were really good at communicating. And so I really, I went and I talked to them about their job and their path and their career. And that's my piece of advice is, is no matter where you are and what you're doing, there are people who are around to help you. And uh, getting mentors along the way, it doesn't, there, there's been no part of my working world at JPL that I have not sought out and worked with a mentor all the way up to uh, when I became a group supervisor for Sarah and Kim, right? That was a management job. I had not done that job before. First thing, get a mentor, somebody who's done that work before. Hey, how do, how do I need, how do I be good at this job? What do I need to do? What do I need to learn? And what does it look like? What's the mental model I need to have? Um, and so mentors, I think, are critical along your path and you're never too old uh, to have a mentor. Uh, but I, I, found as Sarah did that I was a good communicator. I could help. Uh, I got more, I just, I didn't have a plan. A lot of people have a plan. That's great. That's fantastic. Uh, I never had a plan and that's great. That's fantastic. As Kim said, there are many, many roads right through the jungle, through the forest. Um, there are many, many paths to get it right. And I just kind of did interesting work more difficult work and then more difficult work would get asked of me and I would do that and I would do it well. I always worked hard. Um, I always had mentors. I always had, in addition to mentors, I always had uh, peeps, right? I always had colleagues. Uh, hey, I'm struggling with this, Kim. This is what's happening right now. You know all these people. What, what do you think is going on? Oh, well, Trina, you've kind of missed this thing over here, you know? Uh, think about that and, and that might help you be successful. So having mentors that have done the job but also having allies who are your parallel uh your peers is very important and then i've and just sort of support, moved my way up from people that don't work at jpl too from family yeah. and friends that don't work support, at jpl is absolutely. really important yeah. friends and family yeah it's um it's uh especially young women right they 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 i love the fact that science fiction has been so important in representing right even going back to the early days right there's uhura right she's on the bridge right, right. she's she is, you know, she is an officer on the bridge, right? And just by its very, by her just being there, right? It shows you what's possible. I love that about science fiction. Um, and it's so been so influential in my own life. And, uh, and so get your inspirations from a lot of places and then work, uh, work hard 
and mentor and do internships and don't be afraid, right? Tim Mike did a cold call to Donna Shirley, one of the most, you know, at the time she was on television every day for her little rover. I'm like, wow, you called Donna Shirley? That took some. Yeah, time. holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't take no for an answer. When I first applied to graduate school, they sent me a letter that said no. And so I actually called the director of uh, the aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech and I said, hey, you've made a mistake. <laughs> you did not read because you had to write this biography and all this. And when I was an undergrad, I had two or three jobs and trying to work my way, send myself to, to college. And, and I just called him and said, give me a chance and, and I won't disappoint you. And um, so oddly, they did. They, they let me in on a probationary basis and I got my master's and came to JPL and have done really great things. So that's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah. Never give up. Yeah, never give up. <laughs> never surrender. Never <laughs> surrender. <laughs> not, that we're, not that we are of the body. <laughs> it's like this all instinctive. I had to do was start that. <laughs> it was instinctive. We couldn't let it not be completed. <laughs> you, you can't let one happen without the other. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I grew up around uh, scientists and engineers. My dad was a nuclear engineer. Awesome. He actually consulted at JPL in like the early 90s. Um, and he always talked fondly about his time working up there because he was surrounded by brilliant, amazing people. So I was so excited to, to talk to you guys today. And I, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing what you're doing and, and what you're trying to accomplish with everybody. And, and just thank you guys for being part of opening our eyes to everything there is in the universe. Um, well, thank you for having us. This is yeah, and hopefully we'll be there live next year. Uh, that would be amazing, and I would look so forward to that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. On behalf of SD Hukon, uh, Trina, Kim, Sarah, thank you again for joining us for this panel. All three, we have open invitations for our convention in 2021. Knock on wood that we'll be able to do it live. And if you yep. want to bring more of the JPL Mafia down, please. <laughs> you know, Robert, yeah. So until our next panel, I'm David S. Dawson. I've been joined by Programming Director John Leas. And the the wonderful, brilliant, amazing ladies of JPL, Sarah, Kim, and Trina, thank you so much. Thanks. We'll see thank, you. thank you. Thank you. And hopefully in person in a year. <laughs>